much. Thank you, Dorito, for everything and for managing this session and all the amazing speakers that we have today. We are about to begin the last session of the Cyber Week main plenary. After this event end, just remember that we have the blockchain event here. The name of the next session is Changing the Equation. Can we beat attackers at their own game? And the person who's going to manage this session is an analyst, author, and researcher at the Blavatnik ICRC Tel Aviv University and one of Israel's most famous hackers. I want to call to the stage Keren Elazari. Thank you, Manny. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be with you all here this afternoon. Thank you so much. It's always fantastic for me to come back to Cyber Week. I've been a part of Cyber Week for so many years and it always gets better. This year we had more than 9,000 people attend Cyber Week and I hope to see you again with us next year. For our final session, we really saved the best for last. We've got some of the most amazing friendly hackers in the world to join us here at this session. And that is because we need to adopt an embrace the hacker mindset if you're going to have a chance at beating the bad guys at their own game. And that is going to be our topic for this final session. So how can we find the hacker within us? How can we embrace the hacker mindset and bring that sort of adversarial thinking to everything that we do as security practitioners, as defenders, as policy creators, and as technology innovators? To talk about that, we're going to have some amazing people up in a few minutes, but I want to set the stage. I believe that we can absolutely beat the attackers in their own game if we think like the friendly hackers do. In fact, it is my belief that friendly hackers provide a vital role in the cybersecurity ecosystem. Just a few years ago, when I was growing up here in Israel, I was a hacker. As a kid, I was very, very curious. In fact, sometimes, the only way to find the answers to all the questions that I was curious about, well, I had to find those answers on other people's computers. So I taught myself how to write some code. Mostly, I was a script kitty using other people's hacks and tools. And if I'm being totally honest with you, that's, of course, not what I looked like. That's a very nice little girl. But I was so much of a nerd back then. This is more than 20 years ago. I was the kid in the corner with their Walkman. I was the little girl who looked like a little boy and couldn't fit in with her friends because I had different passions, different hobbies, different pastimes. And I think that these are exactly the types of people that we're going to need in order to survive and succeed in the future of cybersecurity. We're going to need the weirdos and the people who think differently and look differently. And that's going to be a theme for us in this discussion today. Just a few years ago, um, 1995, I realized that I wanted to be a hacker because of this woman, Angelina Jolie. She portrayed a fierce high school hacker in the film Hackers. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, if you have. Um, actually, how many of you have seen the Hackers film? Oh, thank you, guys. Quite a few. And you know what? I go to hacker conventions and hacker meetups all over the world. And I ask people, how many of you are here in this line of work? Because when you were a teenager 20 years ago, you saw that film. You saw the film Hackers. For me, it wasn't just about finding my calling. It was also about a role model, an accessible role model for me. I just wanted to be exactly like this amazing character that I saw in this Hollywood movie, Acid Burn. That was the nickname of that high school hacker that Angelina Jolie portrayed. And today, we need not just to converse about cybersecurity challenges, but we also have to create the stage for those friendly hacker heroes to become role models for the next generation of cyber defenders. In 2014, I spoke at the annual international TED event about why hackers can be the immune system of the internet, why we actually need that sort of adversarial mindset if we are going to survive and if we are going to thrive. You heard today and throughout this week about the many challenges of cybersecurity. I believe that if we have a chance, a shot, at balancing the equation between attackers and defenders, it relies on those friendly hackers to help us do that. That's really my point of view. Cybersecurity defenders are not just like these guys or girls. They don't just work for government agencies or for big technology companies. They come from all walks of life. 
And yes, sometimes cybersecurity defenders look a little different. Our hair might be colored in different colors. We might wear heavy metal t-shirts. We might not look like your friendly neighborhood pal. But we, that doesn't mean that we're not out there to help. In fact, around the world, there are hundreds of thousands of friendly hackers. I know because I've met them, I've seen them at hacker conventions and events. So where do you find these friendly hackers? Well, sometimes you have to go far, but here in Israel, we're quite lucky. In fact, just two days ago, here during Cyber Week, on Tuesday, more than a thousand friendly hackers, security researchers, and aspiring defenders, youth, joined us for B-Sites Tel Aviv, which is the largest friendly hacker event here in Israel. And it doesn't just take place in Israel. In fact, B-Sites Tel Aviv is part of a global network of cybersecurity events for community defenders and friendly hackers. If you come from these parts of the world on the map, I recommend you check out securitybsites.org and go to your friendly hacker community meetup in your country. And it doesn't matter if it's in Africa, Latin America, Asia, Europe, or United States. There are hundreds of them, and we're proud to have one right here in Tel Aviv. Or perhaps you've heard about the world's largest convention of hackers, DEF CON. It takes place every year in Las Vegas since 1992. And last year, more than 20,000 hackers attended DEF CON in Las Vegas. When I go there, I don't see criminals. I see talent, I see curiosity, I see innovation. I see people that are passionate about sharing what they know and learning from one another. And I also see the next generation of cybersecurity defenders. I see kids. These are just some of the kids that attend a hacker convention with their parents or by themselves because they want to learn how to become white hat hackers, friendly hackers. In fact, I believe that the job of a friendly hacker is one job that's not going to go away. If you want to learn more about DEF CON, I recommend you check out defcon.org. But very soon on this stage, we're going to have one of the world's global DEF CON ambassadors. And we're very lucky that he has joined us here at Cyber Week. This is the first time that he's come to join us at Cyber Week. I hope he'll return many times. So you'll hear from him very soon. Jason E. Street is a world-famous hacker, a world-class hacker, the global ambassador for the DEF CON groups. We also have a local DEF CON group here in Israel, DC 972. Three. And Jason had just returned from China, where he opened the very first DEF CON in China convention. Because the founders of DEF CON realized that if Chinese researchers couldn't make it to the United States, they should bring DEF CON to them, to bring them into this global hacker community. So very soon on this stage, you'll see Jason E. Street. He's also the star of several television shows about hackers, the author of five books, and a very incredible individual that has been advocating for the mindset of hackers worldwide. And it's not just Jason who will be joining me on this stage, but actually somebody that you might know and love from your previous visits to Cyber Week, our very own Chris Roberts, who is a world-class troublemaker. Each year, he, he has a different color beard, so I wonder what we're going to see on stage right now. Last, week it, last year, it was green. Two years ago, it was blue. Who knows what we're going to see in a few minutes. Chris and Jason are going to talk together about how we can learn from hackers and what we need to do. What are the big questions that we need to deal with right now if you're going to have a chance at beating the attackers at their own game? Before I invite them to the stage, there's also a very important piece of information that I need to give everybody here. So I have a question. Who here is at Cyber Week for the first time? If you're here at Cyber Week for the first time, wow, that's almost 50% of you or even more. Well, I do hope that you plan to return to Cyber Week next year. And here are the dates. We have announced them earlier this week. Please take a photo, save the date. These are the official dates for Cyber Week 2019. I will be here, our cyber horse will be here, and hopefully you will be here too. So June 23rd until June 27 is when we're planning our next Cyber Week event. Hopefully you will be there with us. Until then, may the horse be with you. And now, please join me in welcoming to the stage the incredible Jason E. Street and Chris Roberts. Let's give them a warm Tel Aviv welcome. Thank you. Please. The stage World-class yeah. troublemaker. Thank <laughs> you. Love you. You're awesome. Well, thanks for coming back, Chris. Of Thank you for returning to us. Third year in a row. We can't keep him away. The stage is yours, guys. How's everybody doing? We realize we get to close out this part of the conference 
and we're standing by between you and the alcohol today. So let's start this. I think it's the big green button. Oh, debate time. It's start. What? Come back. Don't mess with it. So quit that shit. <laughs> All right. So this is the conversation. This is the debate that we're going to have. And Jason and I are going to take two questions each. And we're going to box between each side of it and basically have a discussion about can we beat the attackers at their own game. It's one of the biggest questions that we have at the moment. It's one of the areas that we're kind of looking at to see what the industry is doing and everything else. So before we do that, let's go through some quick slides. Jason, over to you, sir. Oh, uh, I'm just Jason. It's like uh, you can find me. I don't like talking about myself too much. So if you want to find out more about me, uh, you can do that. Uh, there's way too much information I don't want on Google uh, as well. Um, and that's about it. I'm uh, just know I'm a blue teamer and a red teamer. I do defense as well as offense. Uh, I like finding vulnerabilities by breaking into stuff so I can make people better secured. All right, mine has a few more words on it, and it's a little correction. So, yeah, the purple goatee. As you noticed, last year it was green. This year it's purple. My daughter is the one that chose it. For those of you that aren't sure, I, we've managed to break a lot of things, hence the troublemaker. Currently, I'm hanging out. Uh, it had me at Hillbilly. I'm now officially over at Lara's. So for those of you that heard Karen talk about B-Sides, one of the original founders of B-Sides was Chris Nickerson, who is the founder of Lara's as well. Obviously, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff on research, some interesting, fun stuff. But again, we're done on this one. So question one, let's go through the simple question. Can we beat the hackers? Give me a quick show of hands. How many of you think that we can beat the bad guys? Give me a show of hands. Interesting. We have optimists. Can we crush it? No. Why? I like being an optimist, too. I, I like being crush an optimist, it. Let me too. crush it. Dad, damn it. All right. So here's my challenge. DEF CON, as Karen said, we're in year 26. This year will be the 26th running of DEF CON. For 25 years, we've stood on stage and we've said, hey, we can fix everything. We can buy firewalls. We can buy IDS, IPS, DLP, heads, next generation, and everything else. And we can protect your data. Yet last year, we managed to lose anywhere from two to four billion pieces of people's information, <laughs> social securities, credit cards, all of this data we managed to lose. Yet we have all the technology, we put everything on the perimeter, we put everything in place to try to protect, to try to beat the hackers, to try, not the hackers, I'm sorry, the criminals. We are the hackers. To try to beat the criminals, to try to beat the attackers, yet we still haven't managed. The technology that we have tried to keep putting in place to put the band-aids on everything year after year after year, you heard Ileana earlier on. How many of you were here for Ileana's talk? When he turned around and said, we're not doing it right. He's correct. We were at RSA four weeks ago. 500 companies, of which I would argue 490 of them, are trying to lie and say, hey, we can fix it with a technology solution. That's not going to do it. The statistics are not in the favor of putting more and more technology. The perimeter. We've spent 20 years looking at the perimeter going, we can protect you with the perimeter. We don't have a perimeter anymore. When you get up in the morning and your email is read by your fridge and it tells your oven and your coffee machine to start because you have a meeting in half an hour, you don't have a perimeter. Yet we still try to solve everything with technology. So, the question I have, do you want to throw anything on this one? I'm, I'm right there with you. It's like, I, I think that we can beat the attackers, but it's like, it's a process. It's like, it's not something that's going to, a blinky box that you're buying is going to solve it. It's like, and I talk about that in the next question as yeah. well. Yeah, let's hit this one. It's like, so, so, so this is the second, yeah, go for it. So what, what do we do with the humans? It's like, um, he brought up a good point. It's like, you see so much technology coming out and we keep getting technology trying to fix the most important problem we have in information security. And what is that? The human element, the users. 
It's like I always hear all the time from information security professionals, and I don't mean to ding on them, but I'm going to because I mean it, uh, is uh, stupid user clicked on the link. Stupid user opened up an email. Stupid user went to a website. Stupid information security didn't properly train their users. We need to stop trying to get blinky boxes in technology to fix the human problem and start getting humans to help protect the technology. It's like, that's our issue. We have uh, the OSI model uh, layer of networking, you know, the seven layers. There's a new one. It's been there for years, but we've been ignoring it. And that's layer eight. That's the human layer. If I can bypass layer eight, why do I need to worry about the others? It's like, if I tell you that there are dancing kittens on the other side of this uh, link, and you click it, and your technology says, this looks like a really sketchy website, do you want to go to it, yes or no? Mother, there's dancing kittens on the other side, of course yes. <laughs> there goes your technology. How good is your technology if you're not properly training the people? Your humans, your users are the best asset that you have going for you. They're not a liability. They're your biggest intrusive detection system you're ever going to have. But you're not putting effort into educating them and fine tuning them and turning them into that. That's what needs to change. It's not the defeatist attitude of like, we'll just put more technology in to help circumvent and isolate the user. Start making them a friend. If you get a delivery driver and you tell that delivery driver, it's like on the first day of the job, it's like, here are the keys. We don't need to tell you anything else. You know, you, you can drive, you got a driver's license, go drive, do your delivery. Is that how you operate? No. You tell them, it's like, look, here's the delivery, here's the, uh, the uh, seat belts you have to use, you have to use your turn signals, you have to obey the law, you have to do the speed. It's like all these things. And what happens if he crashes his vehicle? Well, you, there's probably repercussions, correct? How about if he cr uh, crashes his vehicle like two or three times? There's definitely repercussions. But yet, we give users a computer and say, yeah, just use a computer, this is what you're supposed to do, and then leave them at that. And then when they get compromised, we're like, okay, yeah, we've got to fix that. And we turn information security into a uh, janitorial staff. They're there to uh, clean up the mess instead of being part of the, uh, the branch of actually trying to help and be uh, proactive to stop these kind of things. We're just cleaning it up. It's like you have to make the user responsible for the security of what they're using. That's their equipment. Just like a delivery driver is responsible for their equipment, so is the users are responsible for their equipment. You have to give them that responsibility and you have to train them. So that's what you do with the humans. Just a very quick answer. And so, well, then why did you take so long to answer it? Because it's like the very quick answer, education. Start educating your users. If you don't want liabilities and you want assets, educate them. So to this point, this is, I'm gonna, t 10 seconds on this one. How many of you go through user awareness training at your organizations, government, military, civilian? Put your hands up. Come on, wake up time, almost still. Yeah, how many of you do it once a year? So once a year for half an hour, you are told, don't click shit, don't send shit. And for the other 364 days, you have to remember that. And we expect that to work? Whatever happened to continually training people? Yeah, and especially when the, 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 the quiz that you get is a multiple choice quiz that you get to go backwards on on the web browser if you got it wrong so you can get 100 on the test and be compliant. And it was the same one from last year. Exactly. <laughs> this isn't working. We're cheating ourselves. So if we're cheating ourselves and, we haven't, and we're not able to win, well, then we have a solution. It's technology, obviously. It's like, and, and we get, keep going back to the fact that it, it's not technology. <laughs> it's like you keep trying to augment it. You keep trying to say technology is going to fix me. I love blinky boxes. Okay, come on. They, they're in blue lights now. Okay, they've migrated from red. They've got some green ones. They've got like some that like are multicolored. They're beautiful. I mean, who doesn't like going into the data center and seeing all those blinky boxes? <laughs> but is that really solving your problem? Is that really solving what your issue is? If you're not educating, if you're not treating users as a responsible part of it, and you're not telling them, how many people here have a, a line, an email or a phone number that, they, that their users know? Not that you can have it, and if no one knows it, it doesn't work. They have a number that users know and are empowered to actually call if they see something suspicious. Look at that. I was literally in Amman, Jordan. It's like, this is a story I love talking when we talk about empowering users because I was in Amman, Jordan, robbing a bank there, 
And I had a, a USB drive with uh, malware. They told me to rob the bank. I just didn't do it, you know, walking off the street. It's like, uh, and, uh, and I had a, a drive with a malicious payload on it. And the bank manager was telling me not to plug the USB drive into the computer. And I was like, you're right. I shouldn't be doing this. You should call someone. I, if you don't know that I'm supposed to be here, well, then I shouldn't be doing this. It's like, I shouldn't do that unless you actually have told some, someone's told you to, to, that I was supposed to be here. We should definitely... You should definitely call someone to make sure, because I shouldn't, this is not supposed to be happening if you don't know about it. Uh, I know I'm supposed to be doing it, so it's okay. But if you don't think it's okay, you should, yeah, you should definitely call someone about it. Five times. I compromised five machines before I got behind the teller line where there was actually money, and that's when she lost it. Because I was like, oh, no, there's a, and I was trying to tell her, like, no, I'm not worried about the money. Don't worry. I just want to plug this in. So I didn't care less about the money. It's like. She wasn't empowered. She wasn't educated. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know who to call. So it doesn't matter how well you train your employees. If you don't empower them to contact when they see something suspicious, then all the technology is not going to work. It is not a technology fight. It is going to be a people fight. I don't scan servers anymore on the Internet. That's not my job. I scan social media. Yeah. I scan Facebook. I scan Instagram. I scan Twitter. And you know what I'm looking for? Targets employees that have their badges. You want to see something scary and shocking? It's like, go, uh, go on to Instagram and do hashtag search for new badge. <laughs> see all the people posting their work badges so I can make a copy of it. It's like, uh, see all the different information that's out there. It's like, that's where I'm getting the information from. I'm getting it from your website. I'm getting it from your people. It's like, it, I don't have to break into a server. I don't have to bypass a firewall if I can bypass your receptionist. That's what has to happen. We got to start educating and start relying on technology to assist. Relying on technology to assist us in this fight. But they are not the main combatants. It's going to be the humans. Big time. So if you haven't done the same thing that Jason was talking about, go onto Twitter and see how many people post their first credit card. Or oh their my gosh, lights. yes. That is... <laughs> It's like, like, yay, shopping spree. Only the few moments where I wish I could drink. It's like, you know, it's like seeing those. It's like, you go on, you check it out. So, it's not technology. It is humans. And we're not winning. So, we have created over the last 25 plus years, 40 <laughs> if we go back to the proper IT days, an entire industry to do what? This is where we, as an industry, need to take a step back and ask a very simple question. How many of you, and I'm going to butcher the word, how many of you are aware in the healthcare industry, the physician industry, the Greek Hippocratic, Hippocratic? Hippocratic Oath. Hippocratic Oath. How many of you know the Hippocratic Oath? Do no harm. Yes? Do you agree with this? It's nice to go into a doctor's office and preferably come out alive. It has its uses. So, in our industry, why can we not do the same? Why can we not walk into an organization with our technology, with our training, with the humans that we want to interact with and leave them in a better state than we found them? Why can we not do something like this? And I know the logic, I know the reasons, I know the systems, but we have to change. We cannot continue to rely on the blinky lights, to rely on every piece of technology to build another Band-Aid on top of last year's piece of technology because it didn't work. It's not going to solve the problem. The best that we can do is work with organizations and help them understand the issues. Same thing, you walk into a physician's office, they will help you understand and they will guide you through a process. Why can we not do the same? Why can we not take the concept of do no harm inside IT and inside technology in some form or another and look around us and go, how can we help? This is why we have Cyber Week. This is why we are here. This is why we've come from 12 hours on tin cans with wings, which I didn't mess with this year. <laughs> so he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I have to be nice. I flew Al Al two years ago, and I know damn well there's a man with a gun if I decide to plug into anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier that way. Mm. Why can we not do that? We are all here sharing. We're all here learning and understanding and trying to do the right thing. So as industries, we need to take that message. If it means going to the marketing department and tasering them because they still want to think of hackers as criminals rather than going a criminal steals, a hacker helps. If they still want to put the hooded hacker as the marketing, taser them. Well, I think, I think committing yeah. a, a small you know, assault would probably not help with the whole... Can you, do you have tasers over here? <laughs> But we you can up a good point. We got plenty in the U.S. But, but you're bringing up a good point. But one thing I want to add to that is how many people, how many, do you, how many of your users really want to talk to you? Do you make it pleasant for them? Yeah. Are you actually someone that's seen as a resource, as someone that's actually trying to help and secure the company so they keep a job? Are you the person that tells them no and tells them how they screwed up? It's like, how are we approaching it? You're there as a facilitator. You're there to help the company. It's like, stay safe. It's like, and if they're afraid to talk to you, especially if they click a link, if a user clicks for the link the first time, you don't go and, and put an avalanche on them. It's like you don't, you know, go there and, and, and chastise them. You educate them. You get rid of them, and guess what? The very next guy will definitely catch the link because they not, they're not aware. You educate them because now they're going to be more vigilant. They're now a better employee. If they do it by the fourth or fifth time, fire them. They're, they're a problem, okay? But, you know, that first time, let them be comfortable when they click a link to contact you. If you've not created a relationship where they feel safe in their job, they feel safe in knowing that, that they can contact you without repercussion with education, you're going to be losing. You're not going to find out until months later or until when something very bad does happen and is obvious. Let them know that it's okay to make a mistake once. Let them know that you'll be educated. Let them know what the securities are, how to contact you, that you're there to help. We don't see that. Do a lunch and learn and teach your users and employees how to secure their Wi-Fi. Do a lunch and learn. Teach your employees how to do the proper privacy settings on their children's Facebook and Instagrams and Snapchats and Twitters and whatevers. It's like, teach them how to do that. You know why? Because it makes them more security conscious. They don't care about protecting your data. They never will but they will be more security conscious and they'll bring that into work and they will no longer see you as an adversary, but as an advocate for them and doing their job. That's what you're trying to improve. And that message scales up for companies too. Yes. Walking in and just simply going in and breaking a company, who gives a damn? In 26 years of doing red teaming, pen testing and everything else, We've yet to fail to break into anything. That's great for the ego, but it sucks because it means we've oh. not done our job properly. We failed to teach the blue team effectively how to catch us. Yeah, exactly. I actually, on every one of my engagements that I do, I don't do red teams. I'm not that cool. It's like I do security <laughs> awareness engagements. That means for the first two days of the engagement, I am the worst thing that you've ever happened to you at the worst possible time in the worst possible way. I'm great at parties. It's like, uh, but on the third day of the engagement, what happens? I get caught. I spend the whole time trying to get caught. And those people get put on reports for doing the right thing. I give them something to look up to, not all the things to look down at. It's like you have to give them a win. If all you're doing is showing them what's going on, how do they know to succeed? How do they know how to succeed? You have to educate them. You have to give them something to look at. You'll hear a common message on this one. It isn't about the technology. It is about do no harm. If you are an owner or you are part of an organization that is developing new technology, the biggest urge I have is look at what you're doing and ask yourselves, how can this help? Not how can I sell more? How can I make more? That, go taser the marketing team. But how can I help? How can we stem the tide of what is going on? So. Some final thoughts. This is a good one. So, this one I like. The ult I'm not going to read it. Normally I don't read slides, but I'm going to read it. The ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of comfort. 
or convenience, but where he stands at the times of challenge and controversy. Here's what I put to you. One of the talks I gave earlier this week was talking about staring into the <coughs> abyss. At a technology level, we are looking into the abyss at the moment. There is so much technology, there is so much stuff going on, there is so many things we can continue to break, and we're not fixing them. We are at the time of challenge. It's up to all of us here at Cyber Week and everybody you know to go, what are we going to do about it? Because here, this is the future that we want. This is how we want the future to look. There are some amazing technologies out there. The ability to help save lives to technology. But the problem with that one is we can still break it faster than people can fix it. So we're really not helping that future. Yeah, I, I look at this and, and first of all, it's like I just see that we get robots and I love robots, so that would be awesome. So I want that future. It's like, who doesn't want robots? But totally. one of the biggest problems with our future is like we're becoming more dependent on it. It's like, but we're, when we started off with cars, let me put it this way, we didn't have seat belts. We didn't have a lot of that safety gear. That was an afterthought, correct? It's like, you know, tootling around 20 miles an hour on the streets of London. It's like uh, it's, uh, with the little horn honking and the horseless carriage and, <laughs> and that was fine. And it's like, but now it's like we've realized that we've got technology, now we've got to secure it. It's the same thing with the cars. They eventually became more and more secure. They became more, now we're actually turning them into computers and actually trying to secure that as well. You know, we've got great airbags, we don't have really great you know, systems to thwart you know, hacking attempts inside the car. It's like, so that's got to develop as well. It's like we have to learn that as we develop this future, it's like we also have to learn how to secure it. We can't just keep developing without actually putting security as an afterthought. That's not going to work. That equation does not scale. It has to be something of constant learning. It has to be a constant securing. And that's where the IT department comes in and the security department comes in to talk to upper management. It's like who here has to go to upper management and get a, and get a budget for the next year? Don't you love that? Because if you're doing a really good job, you go up to them and say, hey, we need another million uh, dollars, it's like, you know, for our budget. It's like, uh, if you'll notice, nothing happened last year. It's like, we did a really good job. If you give us two million, two more million, it's like, nothing will happen next year. <laughs> How does that scale? How do you, so you've got to create the metrics, you've got to create the numbers, you've got to create ways to show them why it's valuable. It's like because they've got to invest in the future. They can't just invest in what they see. They've got to invest in the future of what security is going to be. Who here has a medical device or, or been into a hospital recently? They're still running Windows XP. It's like one with a broken hand. There you go. Exactly. It's like <laughs> the last time I was in a hospital, I was terrified. Okay? And not because of my medical condition. But the computer next to me was unlocked running Windows XP, and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, no, this is not going to end well for me. It's like, I wasn't worried about the doctors. We've got implants, we've got insulin pumps that can be hacked, that can kill. It's like, we go through and we look at all these interconnected devices, and we're putting them on the internet before we're even realizing why they should be on the internet. Uh, on the third book I'm writing, I literally kill a guy with a refrigerator. And I don't mean like falling it on top of them. I mean, literally, they, uh, the, it was a smart refrigerator connected to the internet. You turn it off, you make it go down. He's an, a diabetic. It's like his insulin goes bad. Turn the refrigerator back on before he gets back. You can kill people with these devices. There was a university that recently had a problem that a distributed denial of service attack where their whole network was shut down. Do you know who the culprits were? The vending machines and the light bulbs. Their smart light bulbs and vending machines were doing, I kid you not, and you can Google this because I barely believe it either. It's like they were doing HTTP requests to sushi restaurants. <laughs> and it shut down their network. Oh, no. And if your network can be shut down because your vending machine is looking for sushi, you've got problems. <laughs> this is not going to go away, this is going to increase. You got your toasters and your light bulbs and your sh whatever. It's like, name a device. Someone's thinking, can we put the internet into it? You know, it's like, that's a problem. It's like, technology is great and technology is helpful. 
when it's done properly and done securely. So to Jason's point, I gave a lecture this morning elsewhere, and they were very proud of their bio and their nanotechnology research oh, until boy. I brought out $100 worth of Arduino and two $25 SDRs. And I plugged them in, and we took control of their nano research. I was like, hey, what do you want them to do? And they're like, you can't do that. I'm like, I'm doing it. They're like, you can't do that. Like, I did it. They're like, well, we have an entire lab that says you can't do that. I'm like, well, we did it anyway. It's that easy. You want to hack a human in five years' time, it's an Arduino and two SDR cards. That's it. So this is what we want. This is collaboration. This is do no harm. This is humans. This is doing it the right way. This is not what we want. This is 20 plus billion devices coming along in the next two to three years. Not 20 years. This is five and a half to six billion connected people, 20 to 50 billion actual or 10, 15 billion phones and 20 plus billion more devices. We don't have enough to cope with what we're facing now, let alone what's coming down the line. If we carry on going the same way, that's how we're going to be. That's why Jason and I are here to say, hey, we have to change the philosophy. We have to change the way we collaborate. We have to stand together as people, as individuals, as companies, as innovators, as the military, as the government, we have to work together in lockstep. This is simple to say, and it has to happen. I see shaking heads. I don't care. Well, I, I like that too. It's a global community. It's like yeah. not just individual governments, not individual people. It's a hacking community, it's a, and that's why I'm the global ambassador, is because it's a global community. Don't let invisible lines on a map dictate how you help or secure what you're doing. It's like, this is a global problem. This is not an isolated issue. This is the internet now. It's like, we're connected. Our neighbors are everywhere. It's like, and we need to treat them as such. It's like, because some of our neighbors are cool. We all got that cool neighbor. We'll go to the barbecue and that other neighbor that's always looking at us and trying to see what's going on and trying, trying to report us to the police because our, our noise is too loud. So we all got neighbors. It's like, on the internet, there's millions or billions. It's like, you have to understand that. It's a global issue, not isolated. Here's the logic, and it's simple. I, as an individual, will fail. We, together, will succeed. This is why we're here at Cyber Week. You have a collective. You have 60 countries here or more, thousands of people. There's reason to be here. There's reasons to be in Israel here doing this. You have the spirit of life and innovation. Use it wisely, please. So, we're over our time. It's gone red. It's quite fun. And we're waiting to be rugby tackled. It's quite fun to see. Yeah, no one's tackled me yet. So we're I know. Still on we stage. can carry on going. So, here, I have some thanks on this one. And this is, and I'm going to read some of these off. Obviously, where we are, Tel Aviv University. A huge thanks. Thank the staff, thank the people, thank the recorders, thank everybody that's miking us up. They helped, they put this on, they've done this. Make sure you thank them, please. To Professor Major General, retired, where is he? Ezek Ben Israel. I've lost him, he's around somewhere. Please, for crying out loud, give him a hug. And the team that he has. I In will. fact, I will for sure. So. Uh, yeah, put your hands <laughs> together for them. <laughs> To Edo and the team in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for actually letting us into the country. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was against some better judgment on something. I know, we sure. still got to get out of the country. <laughs> this is so we're yeah. going to hold that thought just for now. To Ronnie and the Sharon and the team for crying out loud, they have made sure that we get. We are bad squirrels. We're crazy cats. We don't necessarily follow orders and we do things at exactly the last minutes. They've managed to corral us. To Karen, who was, uh, in fact, Karen is there. She is the ambassador for us here. She is your country epitomized. You thank her and you make sure she damn well goes it. All right, to Ian, to Ezra, to the guys of the red team who dedicate their time 
to making sure this country stays safe. And 82 and everybody else, make sure you thank them. So anyway, and to you, everybody here, thank you from us. A huge, huge thank you very, very much for having us here. Pack the planet. There you go. Thank you. You rock. <laughs>